Welcome to Adult Sunday School with Christ Church Tyler as we continue the study of the gospel in Handel's Messiah. Actually, this is the last session. So um, I guess we could say we're wrapping it up. Let's uh, begin this session with a word of prayer. O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, Grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Well, I think we could say that this part three of Handel's Messiah, the, the, the last part, is about changing into his likeness the likeness of Jesus from glory to glory. So let's, uh, let's continue with uh, this, this study. So well, today we continue this study with um, the believer's resurrection. This is how Charles Jennings and Handel uh, put together uh, the final part of, of, of this, this wonderful work. And as we've seen earlier, it, it follows the church here. Um, we, we began uh, with Christ the King Sunday at the end of ordinary time, went through the anticipation of Advent, the incarnation and Christmas, and then uh, the manifestation of Jesus as Messiah or the revelation during Epiphany, and then Lent and the crucifixion, Holy Week, Resurrection and Easter and Ascension, Pentecost. And now, um, let's just take a little review. It began um, on Christ the King Sunday. These Advent themes uh, came mainly from Isaiah. He said, a coming king will bring peace and comfort to a troubled and violent world. And then we came to Christmas and that powerful chorus for unto us a child is born, the Prince of Peace. Epiphany, again the prophecies from Isaiah and some from Zechariah. Readings from Matthew and John reveal Jesus as the Messiah. Then Lent and Holy Week, he was despised and rejected of men. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. In Easter, Pentecost, lift up your heads and let all the angels of God worship him. And then, hallelujah, Jesus Christ is the King of King and Lord of Lords. Handel himself said that when he wrote the Hallelujah Chorus, I did think, I did see all heaven before me and the great God himself. 
So after two hours of performance, the music seems to come to a point of culmination with this hallelujah chorus. I mean, some people have mistakenly thought that it's, at this point Messiah is over. And of course, at this point, King George uh, rose from his seat. He, he stood up. And uh, hopefully it was out of respect for, for Jesus. But some people said he thought it was over also. So why is this part three even here at all? What more is needed? Uh, the angels had already pro proclaimed glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So Jesus' birth uh, didn't fully restore God's creation. It was only the beginning, the beginning of the end. And much work remains until the wonderful prophecies of Isaiah are fulfilled. And part three of Messiah opens with Jennings connecting a passage from Job with a passage from 1 Corinthians 15. The soprano will sing, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. That's from Job chapter 19. For now is Christ risen from the dead, the first fruits of them that sleep. That's from 1 Corinthians chapter 15.
So part three of Messiah begins with a profession of faith in the resurrection of Jesus and also in our own resurrection. And this profession comes from Job, that tragic figure. You know, Job clung stubbornly to his faith when everything had, had fallen apart. His life called for bleak despair. But he said, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and then he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Um, he was overwhelmed by personal tragedy, and he had very little evidence of a sovereign God. But Job still managed to believe. And Charles Jennings and George Friedrich Handel implied that we should too. And this is, I'm sure you're aware uh, of the fact that this is part of the burial of the dead, right one. This is from the anthem. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I love the Episcopal funeral service. I think it's positive, hopeful. And here we are with that quote from Job. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though this body be destroyed, yet shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not as a stranger. So if there's no resurrection of the dead, and if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our faith is empty without meaning because the resurrection is at the core of the Christian faith. And it, this belief touches every area of, of our life, of congregational life, of ministry. And first of all, the resurrection is an affirmation of the whole life of Jesus. Without it, without the resurrection, the Christian faith can can be reduced a little more than a moral code to, to guide well-meaning people about how to live their lives. And how could anyone know that what Jesus said and what Jesus did are worth following? It's the resurrection. It makes sense of the life and the teaching of Jesus. The belief in the resurrection of the body is also an affirmation of the significance of human life as part of the created world. And human existence is bound up in the life of the material, visible world, and God has a plan, not only for our resurrection, for the resurrection of human beings, but also for the redemption of creation. The Messiah continues, since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. That's again from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 and 22. And then behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. That's from 1 Corinthians 15, 53, 52 through 53.
Well, change will be sudden, happening in the smallest conceivable bit of time, fast as the, a glance or a sparkle or a blink, quiver of the eye. Yet there will be a, a signal. A signal will announce it, a trumpet sound. And in the Hebrew Bible, the sounding of a trumpet puts the listener on alert. God will act again. He'll return in power and glory to restore the earth to its original design. Messiah continues, Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory, from 1 Corinthians 15, 54. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, from 1 Corinthians 15, 55, and 56. So this discourse of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 paints a glorious picture of Judgment Day. When death will be defeated, Christ will reign eternal, and all humanity will be raised together to sing praise. But thanks be to God, who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Messiah continues uh, switching now to uh, St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, that wonderful, encouraging chapter from St. Paul. If God be for us, who can be against us? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Uh, this passage is, is helpful during times of, of challenge and loss, and, and we hear it many times at funerals. Uh, this uh, is telling us that death is not the end. It's just the beginning of a new phase of life in God. It's a beautiful part of our Episcopal funerals, celebrating this new life in, in God. And St. Paul's convinced that nothing can defeat God's love. Uh, the, the conflict of, of the powers is engaged head on and the victor is God's love. So now we come to the conclusion, the conclusion of Messiah. Two and a half hours worth of music. And if you ever attend an entire concert, I would highly recommend that you take a copy of the libretto, the little book, the lyrics. So you can follow them through through the con it makes it much more meaningful. 
But we conclude with this chorus from Revelation. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain and hath redeemed us to God by his blood to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen.
Worthy is the Lamb. John and Revelation and Handel and Messiah sum up all of history in this one mysterious image. Worthy is the Lamb. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. This one more creature standing before God's throne. A lamb, a helpless lamb, a slaughtered one. The great God who became a baby, who became a lamb, who became a sacrifice. The God who bore our stripes, died our death. This one alone is worthy. And that's where Handel leaves us with this great worthy is the Lamb Chorus, followed by all of those amens. Major economists, let us sing of greater things. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.